So today we're going to talk about augmented reality, virtual reality, and how these technologies are going to change your life today and change your life a lot more uh, 10 years from now. So we have a, a great group of panelists here, uh, each, of, each of whom has a unique set of expertise. Um, I'm your moderator, Avram Pilch. I'm the online editorial director for Laptop Mag and Tom's Guide. Uh, and in my role as a journalist, I've gotten the chance to try all the coolest new toys. So I've gotten to use the Microsoft HoloLens, the HTC Vive, the Oculus Rift, the Meta Pro, a whole bunch of different, different headgear and software uh, that really shows, shows me that this is, this is not just a fad, but a, a really ecosystem changing event that's going to change how you interact with technology. So our folks over here, we have Neil Trevet uh, from NVIDIA. Uh, Neil, could you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do? Sure. So hi, everyone. Uh, I work for NVIDIA. We uh, create visual processing um, processors and platforms. So the GPU goes into PCs, um, central to high performance gaming and soon augmented reality and virtual reality. We have mobile processors in phones and tablets uh, that go soon will be in augmented reality uh, headsets. Uh, my, my role is to engage with developers as they use all that cool silicon goodness to get uh, new experiences and applications uh, running. So um, we're kind of in the thick of AR and VR, so happy to be here. Great. And uh, Pete, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you do? Sure. I'm Pete Wassell, the CEO of Augmate. We have a wearable infrastructure platform. So uh, the applications that get put on the devices, we push out those applications to the enterprise, do the device management for enterprises, uh, all the communications to the devices, those types of things. Um, Dave, tell us a little about, about what you do. Uh, my name is Dave Hodson. I'm a team leader for Americas for Zeiss Multimedia. Uh, Zeiss, Carl Zeiss, most people know Carl Zeiss is a, a global leader in optics. We're 160 years old. Uh, we have about 25,000 employees globally, and uh, we represent many different categories in optics. And uh, I'm kind of spearheading my role with the company is to spearhead the uh, virtual and augmented reality. Uh, market space for our company and really incorporate and integrate our optics into as many products as possible. Mark? Hi. <clears throat> so I'm Mark Squark. Um, I'm a full-time faculty member at NYU Polytech. I'm the director of their mobile augmented reality lab at NYU. So if anybody wants to come out for grad work um, doing augmented reality, we'd love to have you. And I'm also, uh, what is it, the, um, I'm an artist, practicing artist, so we've done uh, work around the world uh, with augmented reality. Um, a lot of the times when we're doing work, it would uh, fall in the lines of intervention, um, so we're doing uh, on-site creation, um, content creation. Um, so we're doing um, sort of primitive steps in the direction of Iron Man, where we're actually on-site creating content which is specific to that location, which would be a little bit different than a lot of the creator suites that you get with um, a number of the different uh, software packages that are out there where I would be creating sort of on the server side behind a laptop. Now I'm on site actually um, doing creation. Great. So uh, we have a couple of slides here. If we could advance to the first one. Do, do I have to hit this button or do I not do anything? Nope, that didn't do anything. Do you guys have the slides? Yep. OK. Well, uh, what we were going to talk about was um, sort of the difference between augmented and virtual reality, because it's kind of obviously very important to, uh, to, for people to understand what these two, techn what these two terms mean. Uh, so does anyone on the panel want to take, take a stab? Because a lot of people kind of confuse the two things. They're both Equal, very important, but they have very different use cases. Um, Dave, do you want to give it a shot? Sure. I mean, I'll share from my perspective. Uh, uh, essentially, we look at virtual reality as an, a completely immersive experience, meaning that you're in a physical uh, state of being, and virtually you can be transported to another uh, possible time space uh, location. So uh, a virtual reality uh, uh, experience, you have a, a completely immersive goggle on, 
and you're experiencing either a computer generated experience or possibly a video or visual experience. Could be pre recorded or live. Um, an augmented experience would be an enhanced realistic experience of the time and location and space that we're in at this present moment. So, for example, an augmented glass would have uh, a headset that you could see through and you could see your environment, but there would be an overlay of, uh, of uh, computer generated imagery, et cetera, um, that would enhance your present experience. That's my take on it. Yeah, basically, uh, we talked a little bit about this at a panel last year, and one of the panelists said, the dream of augmented reality is to prevent the nightmare of unlimited virtual reality. But when you have VR, uh, I think we're all familiar with, with VR from movies like The Lawnmower Man. You put on a really closed environment. You can't see out. You, uh, and you, you really live and experience that, that world. That's great for certain applications, for sure, like gaming. I mean, who you, you really want to be immersed. But augmented reality is more like what the Terminator sees when he looks at someone and says, that leather jacket will fit me. It, um, <laughs> what it does is it projects virtual objects onto your real world view. So uh, using that, you can learn about things, object recognition. You can look at an object, and just as you can today with uh, your phone with something like Amazon Firefly. So augmented reality is actually, there. you can use it today on your phone, you can use it today on your tablet, uh, but one of the things that we're, we're looking forward to in the near future is having it omnipresent uh, in, in glasses. Uh, Microsoft is working on this heavily with its HoloLens, and I have to say, I got to try the HoloLens a couple months ago, and it was really, really cool. Um, you know, there, it can be used for obviously just walking around getting information. It can also be used as your computer interface. So Microsoft is looking at it as, and a lot of us are, are wondering, is this going to work? Instead of having a computer desktop with a mouse and a pointer or a touch screen where you reach out and touch the screen, what if your Skype window was projected on that wall? Right. But only you could see it there because you saw it in your glasses. Uh, so that is the kind of thing that augmented reality perhaps will make possible. Uh, and it kind of leads us to the question of how will this change the way that we interact with our computers? Will we still be using a mouse and keyboard in 10 years? Or will I be typing on my arm looking at a virtual QWERTY keyboard projected on my, on my bicep or something? Which, by the way, is, is something, is not just something I'm making up, but people are actually already working on things where you can either have a projection or just see through your glasses uh, a UI or, or something on part of your own body. Um, so I'm curious to throw this open to the panel. What, what do you think in, in 10 years, what, how will AR and possibly uh, VR change how, we, how the UIs that we use on our, on our devices, will they change? Well, I, I think that you know, as far as the keyboard and mouse are concerned, What's natural is speaking. So I think we could probably get rid of the keyboard just by talking or speaking. Maybe in some circumstances, it might not be appropriate if there's people around and you're trying to interact with a, a computer uh, where you'd have to use some other kind of interface. And as far as the mouse goes, it seems like gesture is a pretty natural reaction uh, that people have to be able to interface with devices. Um, I think perhaps, though, in 10 years, <clears throat> there'll be more artificial intelligence to anticipate things and make things more intuitive as far as interacting with computers, and perhaps even your surroundings understanding the person in 3D space. So in other words, and all the way down to all moving body parts, facial expressions, those types of things to, again, anticipate uh, what's going to be expected on the computer. Mark, uh, is this the kind of, uh, is user interface something that you look at in your, in your line of work? Certainly, certainly. So um, again, having done kind of on-site creation, uh, where we're actually um, you know, creating on, uh, augments at specific locations, um, I would say like the average user's probably experience in the next um, by, uh, 25 will be, um, you'll be having a heads-up display kind of experience. Um, probably the understanding of what the display, the 2D display will change dramatically. Um, having done kind of uh, things where we do, it would actually have to manipulate um, things, 
I don't think the physical keyboard will entirely disappear. I think there will always be some sort of physical interface. But I do think you might start seeing possibly embedded interfaces in um, inanimate objects, um, such as I could uh, look at this. I'm 3D tracking the object, and it's calling up an additional in interface, which uh, could allow me additional functionality or something. It might not apply to the coffee cup, but maybe my TV. Like, the remotes become sort of clutter. I could have something possibly attached to like my position, and then it could always sort of be with me at arm's reach, and then it could disappear when I didn't need it or something like that. You could see a lot more um, kind of embedded technologies all over the place. It's it's an interesting debate, uh, you know, what th what technologies are going to be killed or limited uh, by augmented reality because it depends on who who you talk to. Uh, Jace Hansen, who is a work, who is a Hollywood artist, who I've chatted with, had designed the UI for the Iron Man movies. And he said that he's looking forward to being able to like, you know, type on his arm or something. Uh, but uh, in a recent interview, uh, Bill Fernandez, who's one of the founders of Apple, said uh, that you actually would probably, you know, hurt your arm if you were constantly going out and trying to poke at virtual objects. And the sort of tried and true uh, nature of the keyboard and, and the mouse and, and maybe now the touchscreen will, will still be important even you know, for, for the foreseeable future. Uh, what do you think, Neil? Uh, I, I agree with the Apple comment. I think the, um, as we get new technologies like AR and VR, it's new opportunities that create new ways to interact. It doesn't replace the proven UIs that we already have. I mean, yes, typing on your arm with a projected or AR display might be good for a quick text, but you're not going to write a report or, you know, some long text like doing this. It's just not as good as a keyboard. So. Uh, keyboard's not going to go away, but you are going to get, I think, a, a real interesting mix of different new modalities. And the, um, some of them will, will survive, some won't. I mean, holding up your phone to do augmented reality, I would suggest, although it's great novelty today, it's not a long-term user interface that anyone's going to use. It's hopeless <laughs> for anything real and something you'd want to do for more than two minutes. Um, so glasses is going to be the way that a AR comes to the mainstream uh, eventually. And AR, in the end, is not interacting with the computer. AR is interacting with the real world. The computer needs to get out of the way. So uh, obviously, one of the things that's been kind of, uh, I guess, was more controversial last year at this time because Google has kind of gone a little bit underground with the glass. We don't know exactly what's happening with it at this point. But uh, obviously, there was a big sort of cultural backlash against people wearing headsets like Google Glass. Of course, we're looking forward to some of the new technologies that, in, in my opinion, are going to be much more interesting than Google Glass because they cover both eyes and give you a real immersive experience rather than just kind of giving you an eyebrow view. Uh, but I'm kind of curious uh, what Dave thinks in terms of, do you think that we're going to reach social ex a level of social acceptance uh, with wearing a headset, or is it going to be kind of limited to experiences where you're sitting in your chair at home? Yeah, and I think it it's going to depend on what kind of headset we're talking about. So certainly, um, you know, back to the user interface issue, I think that it has to be comfortable and natural and socially acceptable. I think those are the three key issues with any UI. Because if it's not socially acceptable, people won't do it. And we've, we've really experienced that with Google Glass. And if it's not natural and comfortable, which I think we've all become comfortable with a keyboard and a mouse, so it has to be kind of fit in that mold where it's still natural and comfortable. But I think the social acceptance is, is something that you know, it's something that can be adopted over a period of time, and the more and more we see it. I mean, we've, I've been in the head-mounted display industry for 15 years, and we've not seen it to be socially acceptable in my experience. Um, somebody sitting on a, on a train from New York to Boston wearing a virtual reality headset sticks out like a sore thumb. So um, I think that it has to be very inobtrusive. It has to be, it has to look like a pair of glasses, and you really don't, um, you don't know that that person is wearing an augmented uh, headset. So I think that we have some progress to make in, in microcomputing and, and image display and things like that in order, in order for us to, to really get that level of social acceptance where it's adopted on a broad level. Um, but uh, you know, it's, it's, I think that we can get there. I definitely do. So 10 years from now, I think that it would be a really uh, 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 something that's foreseeable. Now, uh, we've talked a lot about augmented reality 
Uh, but virtual reality, which obviously you wouldn't be walking down the street with because you'd run into something. Um, right now, we see a lot of it you know, being used in gaming. Obviously, that's a great application for it. Uh, but are there any other applications that, that we see that would kind of relate more, that people would use on a more daily basis to be productive or, or do something else? What, what do you think, Neil? Well, I think um, immersive uh, 3D video, either captured or actually more interesting to me is live captured video. It was interesting when Zuckerberg was announcing his acquisition of Oculus. He didn't use gaming as his use case. It was, you can have a courtside seat at a, you know, a basketball game, and you'll be, you'll be sitting there, you can look around as the, as the live action is going on around you. you know, they just need to have one three, 360 degree camera. Uh, it's then it's very known technology to beam that out to people. Um, so, I mean, that could, I think that's just as interesting a use case as 3D gaming. Do you think that um, we're going to see some kind of new social problems related to VR when it becomes really good? I mean, right now you, you have to buy like the developer kit or you have to buy uh, something like the new VR One, which um, you know, is, is fairly new. But I don't think we've seen people who are becoming like VR addicted yet. But you know, we've all seen we've all seen the Keanu Reeves movies. So, um, so Mark, do you think this? Do you think we're going to run into kind of some new social issues that we haven't had to deal with yet because of VR? Absolutely. I think like you're starting to kind of <laughs> edging towards the Minority Report. Look at what people look like with a pair of glasses on. Yeah. And people are really sort of getting into it or actually, you know, tapping into the spinal column. Um, you could. Uh, what am I thinking? You're, you'll see strange subcultures start to kind of emerge. Um, the big problems, I mean, I think the biggest issues would be see the level of addiction that you have right now with current smartphones. Um, I'm completely addicted, my wife's addicted, like all, most of my friends are addicted. Um, it's, it's really bad, it's, it's actually a real problem. And then when that thing is constantly in front of your face, if you're wearing the augmented glasses, I mean, um, it's always there kind of a thing. Like with the VR, um, the level of immersion is so high, uh, the kind of case you would look at is Google um, first time using Google Cardboard. And the reaction that you see people getting, there's lots of these videos, that people are just like, kind of, wow, I've never seen, some, like really getting into it and kind of having this reaction. Um, once people start developing content which is specific for this device, you're going to have um, really, really compelling experiences. Why go back to reality when I can be in this sort of space which is amazing or something? So there is this danger um, that I think uh, is very real. So Pete, uh, obviously there's a lot of entertainment value in, in VR. You do a lot of AR stuff. Do you see VR having some business value as well? Well, uh, so I went out to one of our investors is uh, Mike Rothenberg out in Silicon Valley, and he's got a whole fund called River, which has all virtual reality companies. And I was fortunate enough to spend about three hours with 12 companies that were doing absolutely amazing things with VR. Uh, some of them were doing, uh, for example, training. So for example, to bring in someone to test, let's say, to how to drive a forklift or something along those lines, you don't need the forklift. You put the device on the person, it has the whole control panel, all the levers, all the buttons, and it walks them through a test to see how quickly they react and how well they're able to perform those tasks. And I thought that was an excellent use case. Uh, there, was a, <clears throat> there was another company who was using it for, uh, to help patients, it was doctors, to help them overcome phobias. So if someone's afraid of, let's say, a spider or afraid of heights, um, or afraid of flying, it, or afraid of speaking, it would help them walk through that particular fear and with the help of a psychologist, actually get over that fear. And there was a number of use cases that I thought were really compelling. Yeah, um, it's interesting, something uh, for training purposes, you sort of have AR and VR crossing over because uh, one of the things that Microsoft has shown off with HoloLens is somebody, a plumber or whatever, looking at a pipe and then project it on the pipe or instructions on how to fix it. Um, similarly, last year I visited this company, uh, Meta, which is out in San Francisco, and they do, they're do they working on their own glasses, and they showed me a demo where a couple of surgeons were actually using augmented reality to project a virtual patient on, onto a real gurney and to sort of use the patient uh, to, to practice their ER skills uh, apparently, it's a lot less expensive to create a virtual patient than to buy a dummy, 
uh, an anatomical dummy, which is like $100,000 or something. But I could totally see that also being done in a complete virtual space. I mean, why would why did the table need to be real? Uh, who knows? But it, it's actually amazing that you know you don't even need to look 10 years from now. There's a lot of innovation going on and available today. So I wanted to ask our panelists sort of what what is kind of the cutting edge today? What is the most uh, compelling use of of VR and AR that you've seen you've seen so far, Dave? So I have a little bit of a bias towards that because. Um, some of my background was in the immersive learning space. So I spent a lot of time working with the Department of Defense with immersive learning scenarios. So obviously I have a bias towards that, so I believe in that. Um, uh, immersive learning application for students of all, really of all ages, but especially um, in the medical field, um, in the skill-based learning, um, behavioral training, et cetera. I think that um, being able to take a person from their existing state of mind and being and moving them to another experience because as human beings we really learn based on our experiences or the net sum of the experiences in our life up to this point in time. The, the ability to be able to do that for somebody and help them with a phobia or help them overcome some you know, social acceptance issue or whatever um, I think is just a tremendous opportunity for this. Aside from that, I mean, we're really, I mean, the, the, the markets for virtual reality are, are just amazing. I mean, there are new ideas and concepts part, popping up every day that don't require someone to walk around in life with a VR goggle on. I mean, that's, I don't think that that's ever going to be a reality, but I think that for specific needs and for specific applications and entertainment, for example, 360 video is just incredible. Live sporting events, um, uh, you know, uh, concerts, um, travel and tourism, where if you want to go to a, a part of the world that you've never been to before, and you physically can go there still, but being able to experience it in a VR sense, um, I think is, is just kind of a neat experience for people. So, um, but uh, yeah, I think that really the, 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 the markets that we're seeing for this are just, they're, they're evolving and they're, they're just exploding. Neil, what's the, what's the coolest thing you've seen? Well, I, I agree, VR, I mean, the, the, the key thing about VR is that so it, it's just getting good enough that we can generate genuine presence. I mean, that, that's the key word. Um, so, and I'd like to do some audience participation. How many people here have experienced or even know what presence is? Not a few, actually not that many. So, so presence is when you're jacking into your inputs good enough that your uh, subconscious is beginning to override your conscious. So uh, you can be put on you know, uh, VR goggles and you can be standing on a high ledge. And you know perfectly well that you're sitting down in a chair in an office, but your body is beginning to say, you, you need to step back. And your body, your subconscious, is beginning to you know, transmit danger signals and begin to react to that input. Um, and it's, it's getting good enough that we can begin to do that. And that's good. And that's the whole point of VR. But to your earlier point, it's also dangerous. I mean, the intersection of that with your typical first-person shooter game. You now, if you can generate presence in a complex environment like a combat situation that you know, uh, a typical um, first-person shooter game is trying to uh, create, you can actually start giving people PTSD, potentially. You know, it's actually a very interesting uh, area. Um, but a in, in AR, I think the we're, we're not there the, the, the Ray-Ban type goggles for AR are some way off, um, but there are some quite compelling examples beginning to appear of using AR in enterprise uh, guided tasks for engine maintenance. You know, what would you rather do when you're maintaining this jet engine? Would you rather have the goggles here showing you what to turn next or the 20,000 page manual? Uh, that's an easy um, um, both cost saving and you know, making the job uh, more effective. And I think the, I hope we can thread the, our way through. AR and VR has been hyped a lot, and actually just at the beginning, I hope we can you know, navigate not overhyping this too much as these early beachhead applications actually begin to deliver some value. Mark, what is the coolest thing you've seen or, or maybe made? 
Sure. Um, okay, so I kind of second what some of these guys were saying. Um, the coolest thing I think that's coming out of it would be the task-based assistance just in general. I think this has the potential to be like the next WordPress or the printing press. Um, so we could democratize technology for everybody um, just simply looking at things and you would be able to become intelligent about this. I'm in the matrix. I step into the helicopter. I, I suddenly can you know, fly the helicopter. Um, uh, some of the coolest applications I've seen with uh, VAR, um, maybe like word lens. I think that was really when I saw that working the first time, it's like I am on Star Trek. This is, I'm, I'm seeing things that I never thought I would see in my lifetime, translating like language in real time visually uh, would be pretty uh, incredible. Yeah, I mean, for me, and, and FYI for folks in the audience, if you haven't tried these things, you can on your phone. The most interesting thing in AR today is object recognition, and those those apps are available on your phone. Things like Wikitude, Google Goggles, you know, Amazon's. Uh, well, I guess only on on some products, but the uh, Amazon Firefly. When you're able to look at something and get information about it, uh, whether that's looking at foreign language and getting it translated, or looking at uh, you know, or looking at a piece of food and getting the calories, or what I'm looking forward to is going to one of these events and looking at people and having, having uh, facial recognition to know last time I saw them so I can be all cool in the conversation or whatever. But um, you know, I, th I think that's a really interesting use of AR today. Obviously not the most immersive use, but one of the most practical. What's the coolest thing you've seen, Pete? Well, we work with industry, so they're enterprises. And uh, we believe that this technology, it's gonna usher in essentially the next industrial revolution. So never before in history have we had this opportunity to have these devices on workers. And <clears throat> there's, thing, there's aspects of safety, you know, informing someone when uh, a forklift is nearby or, or some sort of machinery or there's microphones on these devices. So if it's really loud, warn people to put in their ear protection. Um, we see applications in aerospace, automotive, a supply chain, medical, where you're doing a lot of assistance for people where there's tasks that are complicated, maybe 30, 40 steps that have to be done in a particular order, uh, even compliance, standard operating procedures that have to be done. So it's, do you have the manual or do you have, you know, here's step one, here's step two, here's step three, here's step four, or I've, you know, verbally signing off, I've done step one, I've done step two, I've inspected part one, I've inspected part two. Management knowing precisely when someone's in a particular uh, step. Um, these devices, they double as a pedometer. So for example, with big data, when you start to analyze and look at the data, if you determine workers are walking for 45 minutes a day, you, you might actually change the layout of your factory just based on this kind of information. So all the data that's gonna be generated along with the data that goes down to the devices and helps people, I think it's gonna transform industry. Well, I'd like to thank, that's all the time we have. I'd like to thank all of our panelists here. Uh, it's been very interesting. I encourage you guys to, uh, to, to continue to, to learn more and try out some AR or VR apps. Thank you.